No problem. So then, um, the um, but in any case, um, <clears throat> wanted to go through a couple of things. Now, one of the questions, first of all, is the you know even now it's been two years since the little development of our uh, of our um, um, this resistance movement within the society really got began and begun in, in the, uh, 2012, especially after the general chapter of July the 14th, 2012. And uh, essentially, you know, a movement because of the, well, a change in doctrine. A change, and that's what it boils down to, a change in doctrine. This change in doctrine has been developed over many, many years. It didn't happen overnight. Uh, there have been many levels of preparation. But the day, the magic day when the doctrine officially changed in the SSPX in a visible way was officially on July the 14th, 2012. Hmm. On that day, the general chapter issued a, a statement. And it was the very first statement issued since the issue of the founding of the society. You said really one foundational document, really, which is the 1974 Declaration of Archives of the Fed, November 21st. That declaration was a declaration, of course, for Archives of the Fed at the seminary, but it really was a declaration that summarized in one short statement the belief and practice of any true Catholic since the Council. And that, uh, you know, that we, we adhere with all our hearts to Rome, eternal Rome. Which is what we do. We adhere to eternal Rome with all our hearts. But we refuse, and we have always refused, the Rome of neo-modernist and neo-Protestant tendencies. So we see there's two Romes. The eternal Rome and conciliar Rome. And it was a cardinal that said that to Archbishop Lefebvre. He says, you know, you, you must follow the Rome of the council. You must follow the conciliar church. And you'll notice, actually, whenever the popes speak since Paul VI, they all speak of the, the council, following the council, the conciliar church, implementing the council. You know that there have been 20 councils in church history. In the other 19 councils, there was never a, we must be the Church of Trent. We're the Church of Florence. We're the Church of Constantinople I, Constantinople II, Constantinople III, Constantinople IV, the Church of the Council of Constance, the Church of the Council of Jerusalem, the very first council, the Church of Nicaea. Never was the Church the Church of Nicaea. It was always the Church of Jesus Christ. It was always the Church founded by Christ. And these various 19 councils, all they did was profess clearly the Catholic faith and they defined error, uh, uh, truths against the heresies of their particular times, maintaining the same exact faith so that there's only one church. It is the first council of the church in 1962 to 65 in which we say there is the church of the council, the conciliar church. They themselves refer to it as a conciliar church. Now, one of the things that we've noticed in the last couple of years, that it's become more open since 2012, uh, is now the new society no longer believes that there are two churches. There's only one church. Father Stalin himself says, he was, uh, put an article out against the uh, resistance, and now Father Simelon, another article just recently against the resistance, and they speak about the fact that we cannot say that there are two churches. Archbishop de Lefebvre said there were two churches. It's right there in the first two paragraphs of the November 21st, 1974 Declaration. The eternal Rome we adhere to with all our hearts and all our souls. That's one Rome. And then there's another Rome. The Rome of the neo-modernist and neo-Protestant tendencies. The modernist Rome of the Council. And we refuse and have always refused Vatican II and all the reforms that come from it. That's the essence not only of the SSPX from its very beginning, that is the essence of all true traditional Catholics following the Catholic faith of the last 2,000 years. We now see a shift. We refuse, for instance, Father Ostan said in one of his talks against the rumors, he said, I maintain, said Father Ostan into one of his talks, I maintain the same position of our church of the faith and we, society, with Bishop Fillet, maintain the same vision of Archbishop Lefebvre 
and we continue to refuse all neo-modernist and neo-Protestant tendencies. And notice the small shift. <laughs> Arsus of the Fed said, we refuse the Rome of neo-modernist and neo-Protestant tendencies. Father Rothstein quoted Arches of the Fev saying, we refuse neo-modernist and neo-Protestant tendencies. You can't refuse tendencies. You can't punish tendencies. You can't execute tendencies. You can't really refuse tendencies. You have a tendency to be disrespectful. But when you're actually disrespectful, that's not a tendency. That's an act of disrespect. The tendency is something floating in the sky. That's why Jesus of the said, we refuse the Rome that has these tendencies. We refuse the modernist Rome. We know what we refuse. The conciliar church. We cannot be obedient to the conciliar authorities until those authorities return to eternal Rome. It's that simple. Now they tried to change it. And they say, oh, we haven't changed. But we're still against neo-modernist neo -modernist and neo-Protestant tendencies. But we're not against Rome. In the, in the article, you know, we must get back as soon as possible, says Father Simonin, an article of, uh, of just, uh, just on the sspx.org just uh, only a few days ago and appeared on the article. And it's, it's still there. Avoiding a false spirit of resistance. And it says that, uh, you know, we have to... We remain the only and last witness of the tradition of the church in its integrity. We, the SSPX. But we cannot keep this treasure for ourselves alone. So we are the only bastion of truth, according to Father Simonet. The SSPX. And we are the last bastion. We are the only and last witness to the tradition of the church in its integrity. So there may be others that witness the church tradition, but not in its integrity. But we are the only and last witness to the tradition of the church in its integrity, but we cannot keep this treasure for ourselves alone. We must rather aspire to placing it in the hands of the church, and therefore of the Pope, as soon as possible. That's April the 2nd, 2014. As soon as possible, we've got to put our hand in the hands of Pope Francis. <laughs> now, this is now it's interesting because at the exact same time, we say that we don't like certain aspects of the, of, for instance, where we are deeply concerned about the canonization of Pope John Paul II. And that uh, we can't accept this canonization of Pope John Paul II. But then at the same time, Father uh, Fluger says, he's the number one authority, he says in January, get used to the fact that they're going to canonize each other. It's normal for them to canonize each other. So don't, don't be too scandalized. Don't be bothered. And then, at the same time, Father Glez writes an article that says, I'm bothered. So Father, Father Fluger says, don't be bothered. Father Glez says, be bothered. The mouth is speaking two things. We used to speak only one voice. This is done, this is called mind control. Preparing the people for the collapse. That's already happened. Make them think that they're preparing for the collapse. It's already happened. So that, the, uh, so that we have to get in with Rome as soon as possible... As soon as possible. So, uh, now, what is the problem? We've, always, we've stated multiple times, very clearly and simply, what is the reason why we are opposed to the new direction of the SSPX? Not because of a deal with Rome. That is secondary. We are opposed to the new theology. Why were we opposed to a deal with Rome? Back in May of 2012, we had our big priest meeting in Asia, in the Philippines, with Father Couture. And, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, there you know that it's interesting, the priests of Asia, 
Uh, Father Ortiz was there in the Philippines with myself, myself, Father Giselle, uh, Father Vala. It's four of us resistance priests who were there in Asia together. And in the Philippines at the time, and Father Vala was in the Philippines, he went back to India, but we were all in the Philippines at that time. And Father, uh, we, we said that um, we are against this deal with Rome that Bishop Filet is talking about because if we make a deal with Rome, it, it creates two problems. Number one, it equals a compromise of faith. Because if we agree to put ourselves under the modernists, with the modernists, it means we accept the modernism. Furthermore, example that I gave in the priest meeting, Father Couture didn't have an answer to. If I asked Father Couture, Father Couture, can I open a chapel in Iloilo or in Zamboanga? In the Philippines. He says yes or he says no. But what am I asking? I'm asking can I put a building there? Can I uh, say mass on such and such a street for these people? It's a nuts and bolts practical question. And then he has to decide are there enough people there? Uh, can, do we have sufficient support? Can we stretch our resources to be able to take care of it? Yes or no. Whether he says yes or no, I accept whatever his answer is because it's the answer of the superior about nuts and bolts. But if I go to the Bishop of Zamwanga, the Novosoto Bishop, and I ask him exactly the same question, can I build a church or start a chapel in Zamwanga? It is a totally different question. Because I'm asking him, can I celebrate the Latin Mass in Zamwanga? I'm not asking about buildings and nuts and bolts. I'm saying, can I celebrate the Mass? And as a priest who's obliged to celebrate the Mass, I cannot ask that question. Imagine you, for instance, come to the priest after 20 years, Father, can I stay married? <laughs> you can't do that. In fact, if you ask the question, you're guilty of mortal sin, strictly speaking. Because by asking the question, you are doubting your marriage. You're stuck until you're dead. Be miserable and liberal. <laughs> you're stuck. You cannot ask the question, and if you ask the question, it's a mortal sin because you're putting in question something that cannot be questioned. Can I stay married? You can't ask that question. Can I stay a Catholic? Can I still believe in God? Can I still believe in the 12 articles of the Creed? If we ask those questions, it means that we put in doubt our faith, and therefore, strictly speaking, barring any external circumstances, it's a mortal sin against the marriage or against the faith. So therefore, I cannot go to the Bishop of Zamwanga and say, Bishop, can I please say, can you give me permission to say the Latin Mass here? Because when I ask that permission, I am saying that he already has a Mass here called the New Mass, which I accept. And if he says no, then they don't need the Latin Mass here. I am saying yes and no, asking yes and no about the Mass. When I ask Father Couture, I'm asking yes and no about a building, about nuts and bolts, about practical considerations. The same text, can I say Mass in Zamboanga, two totally different meanings, and therefore, if we put ourselves under modernist Rome, we will have to ask the bishops, can we say the Latin Mass in the Melbourne Diocese? Please. <laughs> Asking the question equals a mortal sin against the faith. We don't ask. We're saying the Mass here. And we don't care if he doesn't like it. <laughs> Not at all do we care. Now the fact is, when the day comes that he brings back the true mass in the Melbourne Diocese along with the true faith that goes along with it and not just smells and bells. And he teaches the whole universal Catholic faith and he does not teach heresy and he does not press spread errors and he spreads the true and Catholic faith. Then we can ask him, can I say mass in Melbourne? Because the question is about nuts and bolts. And the bishop has a right to answer such questions but not about the faith. So therefore we are against the deal 
not because of the signing of paper was a matter of prudence, but because the signing of paper under a modernist equals a matter of faith. Secondly, we were against the signing of a deal because it, even if it wasn't a direct act against the faith, it would be an indirect act against the faith because the danger of signing a deal with a modernist is that they will make us become modernist. That what will happen is we will lose our faith and we will say things like Vatican II and enlightens and deepens the faith. If we make a deal with Rome, we may say things like the new mass is legitimately promulgated. If we make a deal with Rome, we might say things like religious liberty and ecumenism must be understood in the light of tradition. And tradition must be understood in the light of ecumenism. Therefore, we were against the deal. What happened? April the 14th, April the 15th, 2012, Bishop Fillet, in the name of all priests of the Society of St. Pius X, signed a doctrinal declaration. Doctrinal declaration. Nothing prudential. Nothing about practical nuts and bolts. Doctrinal. This doctrinal declaration has ten points. This doctrinal declaration says that we accept Lumen Gentium number 25. We accept the new mass legitimately promulgated. We accept the new code of canon law in its entirety. We accept the um, Vatican II enlightens and deepens the faith. We accept that religious liberty and ecumenism must be understood in the light of tradition. All of these things are lies. And they are contrary to the teaching of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, who was the founder of the SSPX. Contrary to what we were taught in the seminaries, contrary to the teaching of Jesus Christ, and the, on the 260 separate popes or whatever that came before the council. Therefore, who cares about the deal? <laughs> the reason we were against the deal is because the deal might make us compromise in the faith. But we've already compromised the faith. So the deal has become irrelevant. Like Father Hugo used to say it this way, we were worried about the deal. And the deal is sneaking through the back window. So we took our machine guns and were aiming at the back window. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Meanwhile, they moved in the front door. <laughs> And they set up shop all the way around us. We were looking. They didn't come in the window yet. <laughs> they came in the front door. <laughs> the front door is doctrine. The back window is deals and shenanigans. We were worried about them coming through the smoke, and they came right through the front door. And 40 priests of the SSPX, the top 40 priests of the SSPX, fell for it. And why did they fall for it? For the sake of unity. On July the 14th, 2012... They signed a document, which you should all read, the Doctrinal Declaration, of July 14, 2012, the general chapter. You can find it at dg.org, sspx.org, the sspx websites. We stand at the tomb of the venerable founder. In other words, he's dead. <laughs> united behind the superior general. We used to be united in the faith. Now we're united behind the superior general. Whatever the superior general says and does, that's what we believe. You know, I've dealt with this many times in the last several years. One of the duties that I had in recent years in the society, my last six or seven, six, seven years was in, in, in India and in the Philippines, in Asia, in the Society of St. where I was expelled on October the 12th, uh, October the 3rd, 2012. And the, uh, one of my duties was to meet priests and bishops. I met over 300 priests and over 20 bishops. Talk about the Latin mass and tradition. And remember, several of the priests told me, I asked them, what do you believe? He says, you want to know what I believe? He goes, yeah, ask the bishop. <laughs> <laughs> and they told me that in America too. He said, what do you believe? You want to know what I believe? I'll tell you what I believe. Ask the bishop. And then I asked five bishops, at least five bishops told me, I said, what do you believe? You want to know what I believe? Ask the Pope. <laughs> That's what they said. You know what one of the bishops told me? And several of the priests. He goes, can you come back and tell me? So that way I'll know. <laughs> Go and ask the bishop what I believe and come back and tell me what I believe. 
Because I believe whatever he says, that's Lumen Gentium number 25, that we are obliged to believe with a religious assent whatever the bishop says. Forget about the Pope. It's the bishop. Whatever the bishop says with a firm will, you must believe that these walls are pink. And I say it with a firm will. And you have to believe the walls are pink. But if you go to the other room over there, it's a different diocese. He believes the walls are purple. So when you get over there, you've got to check with that bishop. Over there, the wall's purple. Over here, the wall's pink. Mm-hmm. And so the problem is that we must believe whatever the authority says is a firm will. That's one of the errors of Vatican II. It's also an error of the heresy of modernism. Part of the error of modernism. What must be believed? According to modernists, whatever the latest teaching of science and philosophers is, this must be believed because it's infallibly true. So now we take that error, a heres- part of the heresy of modernism, we apply it to the Catholic Church, Lumen Gentium number 25. So therefore now we, we heard it so many times, I don't know more than the bishop. The bishop decides what's true. I believe what the bishop says. Now we hear the SSPX, I don't know what I believe. Ask Bishop Follet. That's what we believe. The same error transposed into the society. It's Vatican II all over again. And what are they saying? You don't, you're not theologians. You don't know the doctrine. You don't know the faith. You need to check with the... You need to just trust the priests. Trust the bishop. Did you go to the seminary? Did you get a doctorate in theology? Did you study uh, St. Thomas for four years or seven years, six years... Did you, did, you, uh, did you learn what the bishop learned? No, I never. Okay, then shut up. <laughs> now the fact is that throughout the last 2,000 years of history, being silent is something Catholics have never done. Mm. Little boys have stood up against popes, bishops, priests, kings. Mm. They have stood up. St. Paul resisted St. Peter to the face publicly because he was to be blamed. That's what he did. Because St. Peter was making a grave mistake. And it wasn't even a heresy. It was only favoring of it. So there is... Why is it that we... What is the effect? What is the effect of this shift? Since it is an official shift, it doesn't matter what the individual particular priest believes. For instance, it is stated officially in the Cor Unum of March 2013... Now remember the Corunum is our official uh, document. It's like our Acta AAS. It's like our Acts of the Apostolic See of the SSPX. Every priest and every member of the SSPX receives the Corunum. It says the names of the priests in the Corunum, who's members of the society. It says our official places where we're assigned. Uh, it, it gives the addresses and phone numbers of the priories. It says the decree is coming from the general house. It tells us new houses that were established, old houses that were closed. And any decrees are of the Superior General in the Society. In March of 2013, the Corunum says two things. At first, it republished the April 15, 2012 declaration that was sent by Archbishop Bishop Fillet to Rome. By reprinting it in the March Corunum, it means it is an official text of the SSPX. And it cannot be said that it's not an official text because it was put in the Corunum and given to every priest. So that no one can say they're ignorant of it. Oh, I don't know what it says. Oh, I don't. I, every, every priest of the society, every single one, received it without any exception. Secondly, there is an explanatory note which Bishop Fillet put next to the uh, doctrinal declaration. Why did he put that explanatory note? Because us priests of the society that rejected the heresies contained therein have publicly condemned it and criticized it ever since it became public in February of 2013. So therefore, he put an explanatory note in March of 2013, explaining, number one, there is no error or of any kind in this April 15th declaration that we sent to Rome. So Bishop Fale says, there is no error in that declaration. And then he verifies and reiterates the one that has been mentioned the most, which is the acceptance of the new Mass as legitimately promulgated. And therefore, he says, we accept it, and to number three, paragraph six, what Archbishop Lefebvre accepted in 88, and that is that the new Mass 
Hazor Kisud Lefeb accepted, it didn't say the year, but the new mass is legitimately promulgated. This is a lie. Archbishop Lefebvre taught the new mass is a bastard mass, an illegitimate mass. And not only that, but it's not exactly in the secret archives of the SSPX. <laughs> Everybody in the world knows that the SSPX is the organization, society against the new mass that says the new mass is illegitimate. Now the SSPX says we always held that it was legitimate. When everybody knows who's a member of the society, not only the priest, but also the faithful. And our Lefebvre said, remember, when it comes to doctrine, you have the right as faithful, as Catholics, you have the right to know the doctrine of the priests. You have a grave right to know it. And if you doubt the doctrine, you must find out. You cannot stay in doubt. You must find out. You must ask the priest, do you really believe Jesus is God or not? If you doubt it, you better find out. <laughs> do you really accept Vatican II or not? Do you really accept the new teaching or not? When there is doubt, you must make it clear. And if there is an official text, which we have, which says that Vatican II is in line with Catholic tradition, which is what we have in the March Corunum published, then there must be a retraction equal to the statement of its acceptability. There must be another written document from Bishop Filet and the superiors of the SSPX which retracts in a written and clear manner all of the errors contained in the April 15, 2012 Declaration of Doctrine given to Rome. It's not in any way a matter of prudence. Now what's happening? Now they say that uh, you know the, uh, uh, the the deal with Rome may happen this year. It may happen this year. It's interesting how in the exact same Dici we have an interesting point in the same article. Here in one article in Dici in the SSPX website it says we must make we must pray for our, we are confident we're going to have a deal with Rome as soon as possible. In the exact same website at precisely the same time. We have another article that says, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> same place, same station. Mm. Why are we giving a double message? Now, the second message I just read you is buried lower in the site for those people that are looking for that. The other one's on the front, right in your face. So, avoid a false... So that that way, when we say in the resistance, you see, Father Sibylin says, we got to make a deal with Rome as soon as possible. They come back and say, no, no, we look at the website and Father Glenn says that we are against the deal, that we are against the canonization of Pope John Paul II and I think it's going to be this bad situation as long for a long time. So pull out quote number two against quote number one. Quote number one is on the front page. Quote number two is buried. You've got to dig for it, but it's there. You can dig for it. It's there. It's buried. Mm. And quote number two also, furthermore, is not a contradiction of quote number one. Quote number two is, I don't think it's going to happen very soon. Quote number one is, we are confident that it's going to happen, and we must try to make it as soon as possible. Those are just both statements of opinions. They are not contradictory in their own opinions about when the deal is going to happen. Father Gles doesn't speak against the possibility of there being a deal, and Father Simulan speaks in favor of it, that we have a grave obligation to search for this deal, just like Archbishop Bishop Fillet said in the October uh, talk of 2013 in Kansas City, that we are obliged as Catholics to want to have an agreement with Rome. Now this has two major problems. Number one, we are Catholics. Therefore we have an agreement with Rome that came with our baptism. As a Catholic, I am a Roman Catholic. When I was baptized, I was baptized into the Roman Catholic Church. My very blood is attached to Rome. My faith is attached to Rome. And if I want to become attached to Rome, it means that I'm not Catholic. I am a Roman Catholic. I am attached to Roman faith. I am attached to eternal Rome. I am attached to Rome in the, far, in the deepest core of my being. 
I cannot say that I want to be attached. When we say we want to be attached, it means that we are doubting our attachment or we know we're not attached, both of which are unacceptable to a Catholic. Like you doubting your marriage, or me doubting my priesthood, or doubting the Catholic faith. We have no right to do that as Catholics. So therefore, we can't be wanting a reunion with Rome because we are already united with Rome. What we want is for conciliar, modernist, heretical Rome to convert and come back to true, eternal Catholic Rome. That's what we want. It is Rome that must convert, not us. And therefore, we don't want an agreement with Rome. We don't need an agreement with Rome because we already agree with Rome by being Catholic. We only want Rome to come back to the faith. That's all. So we shouldn't switch to a false ground of saying we want an agreement or we want to, we want to come back to Rome or we must desire a reunion with Rome. No, not at all. Archiza Lefebvre was not in any way disturbed about the excommunication that he received on July the 1st, 1988. He wasn't in the least way bothered. He said in the consecration sermons on June 30th, we hold these penalties as nothing. Nothing. Just like St. Athanasius. Was he disturbed? He was excommunicated three times? No. Not at all. Because we are Catholics. And we know the eight Beatitudes. And the eighth Beatitude, which St. Thomas says is the perfection of the other seven is to be persecuted for Christ. Rejoice and be glad when they shall say wicked things about you and when they shall persecute you. And our Lord himself said the day will come when they throw you out of the synagogue thinking to do a service to God. These are not causes of sorrow, they're causes of joy. To suffer or to be condemned in the name of Christ equals a cause of joy, not sorrow. We are supposed to know our faith. Therefore, his little fan was in no way disturbed about the excommunications. It's like Father Giselle and I, we rejoice when we receive our completely worthless excommunication papers from the SSPX on October the 3rd and October the 4th, 2012 in Singapore. We were at headquarters, but Father Couture, unfortunately, wasn't there. He is always traveling, but he wasn't there. So it was a delegate that gave us our excommunication and expulsion papers. We rejoice. Because we were able to imitate Archbishop Lefebvre. We were able to remain faithful to the SSPX. We were able to maintain the truth. Able to, be, to, to continue to condemn the errors. And because of this, the superiors decided that it was unacceptable. It used to be very acceptable when I was ordained a priest. And somehow over the years it became unacceptable. Something changed within the society. Within the hierarchy. So in any case... The, uh, uh, the, this, I think it's not necessary to go on too much there. I uh, will say that our essential problem is that the change of doctrine, and many are denying it. Oh, there's no change. We haven't changed. But then they won't repudiate anything. Excuse me, how could um, Bishop Fally excommunicate? Not excommunicate, expel. Oh, expel. Expel. Yeah. Like, you know, it's excommunication from the SSPX. <laughs> Uh, I received a kind of excommunication with Father Giselle because we were forbidden the right to say Mass even privately. This is before we were expelled. We were, they told, uh, Father Couture said that we could not be absolved of our sins. We deserved a Bishop Fillet. So that's the kind of excommunication. Um, and that was in uh, August or September of 2012 before our actual expulsion was completed. And uh, we weren't allowed to say Mass even privately on the side altars. And we were told that we couldn't have our sins absolved. And uh, we were forbidden any access to the sacristy. We said, we can say Mass at 3 o'clock in the morning on the side altar. And they said, no, no, forget it. And so that's a kind of excommunication. So, Father, yeah. what happens to the people that you say you had at church? And quite a big group came. What happens to those then? You mean the people in... Who uh, were with the St. Pius Defense Society. Then you were put out. Uh -huh. who really wanted to follow you because they knew you were giving them the truth. Right. 
in everything, and all of a sudden you're tossed out, where did they go then? Well, uh, what they did was they called us to come, and Father Giselle and I came. Originally, there was only two of us, and now there's about 50 of us. And uh, the, uh, in the, uh, less, than the uh, moment, less than two years. And uh, we started in the Philippines, which is where we were stationed. Uh, and uh, September the 16th, 2012, was our first official Mass in Manila. And uh, two, two Masses, two priests, and one faithful. So it was, uh, and that was the beginning. Uh, now we have about more than 70 places where we say Mass throughout the world. Uh, there are other priests that help us. Now some of them, uh, 70 places where we say Mass, there's over 100 places of the resistance throughout the world. Um, and about 70 where we say Mass. Um, and uh, this is one of them right here, where we go and say the Mass and take care of the people as best we can and we go to the other places. Uh, and um, it, we didn't know it would grow like this, but people call from all over the world. People are still calling. Like just two weeks ago, I got a call from Poland and another one from Switzerland, and then, of course, another communication from Africa, and then, of course, from England and Ireland and Scotland, uh, which is the places that we go to anyway. Uh, and, uh, and so, the, uh, uh, plus, of course, new places in the United States that people are calling. Uh, and then, of course, also on this trip, we're going to be going to Perth. So... This will be the first time going to Perth on this trip. When I came here last year, uh, it was the first visit. And when I came here last year, the people, uh, again, I had never been to Australia before other than passing through Sydney on the way to the New Zealand, which, as you know, is part of Asia. Because the New Zealand was made part of Asia in the, in, in the SSPX. And so I used to go to New Zealand and do retreats there and do things there. When, I, when uh, New Zealand was under, but I passed through Sydney sometimes. I go to the Sydney airport, and I went out of the airport twice. That's about it. So I was uh, so it was first call 2012, and then finally came last year. I wasn't able to come in 2012, and uh, made that first visit, and then uh, and actually primarily for Streaky Bay. It was primarily the play, the destination, Brisbane and Streaky Bay, and then it and then it uh, it went from Brisbane and Streaky Bay to uh, you know uh, came to Tainong, uh, came to uh, Sydney, and then uh, you know to Adelaide uh, as well. And then I got a call to go to New Zealand, but was not able to go at that time. Most people think they called me at that time disappeared. Now I was able to make a first visit to New Zealand on this trip. Now when I came there last year, I said, look, Father Giselle and I, you know, we are, we, people are calling us all over the world. Uh, we're doing what we can to, to give them the faith and mass sacrament as often as we can. But uh, none of us are, and we can come to Australia maybe once in three months. That's about all we can do. And so if Father will come one time, then I'll come another time. What happened, however, was Father Ortiz ended up having his visa situation, right? So he came over here. He was there four months. And uh, Father Giselle was able to come twice. And this is my second visit, so now me twice. And then Father Giselle is going to come again next month. Father Valen is going to be able to come after that. Because uh, Father Valen is now helping us very actively. And, uh, and so when we came the first time last year... It was a thought that somehow I'll come from America or Philippines or wherever I'm traveling at the time, somehow stop by Australia on the way out or on the way back. Somehow Father Giselle has come by somehow from the Philippines. Because remember, we're saying Mass in about 70 different places. And so, the, uh, and it was, it's been slowly growing. People would continue to call, but there are small groups. This is a big one. There's small groups, you know, and, and uh, there's a few bigger ones. But nothing, we have in Maasin, in the Philippines, Leyte, we have 120. Now in Ormoc has grown to about the same size since that storm. And now that we're, you know, help rebuild and all that, we've got about 120 in Ormoc as well. Uh, that, was, that was about 15 people. Now it's 120 because of the, we're rebuilding in the area of, the, of where our little chapel is. And we're teaching catechism and all that to the people in that area. I came there right after the storm, right after that big uh, typhoon last year. And then Father Giselle now is there regularly, and we have another priest coming and helping us and going to say Mass there as well. And, uh, and so, the, so it's developing in Ormoc. Uh, but the, the new people, new people coming you know, from, the, from the storm. And, uh, but throughout the world, they're calling, and we just come. But we have to, I think what God is demanding right now is faith, real faith. Are you ready to stand for the faith without the guarantees? Without the certitude that you're going to have a priest in Mass every week, 
You know, the first people that called me, one of the first people that called me, I was going to say the place, I won't say the place, uh, but before the first people that called me, I canceled my ticket because they changed their mind at the last minute. Because they said that, um, look, Father, we want you here. You've got to be here every Sunday. You've got to be at 9 o'clock Mass. We need school. We need this. We need that. Blah, 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 blah. And in fact, uh, Father Bolick wanted me to take over his parish in Wisconsin. He was dying. And he was fully supportive of what we were doing and everything. He was very happy. But he wanted me to take over the parish. And I told Father Bolick, even though you've got 500 people in your parish, uh, I'm being called now throughout the world. And I have to take care of our people first and the faith. And I can't get tied up in only one parish because there's a global crisis and people are calling everywhere and the priests aren't responding. So since the priests aren't responding, I'm required to respond. If other priests respond, then I don't have to respond. But if other priests refuse to respond, then I have to respond. Mm. That simple. And so therefore, you know, uh, we try to get other priests, local priests to help out, local priests to take over. And uh, it hasn't, but the thing is, one thing that has happened, my Father Giselle and I, and uh, Father Hugo, when we met, we had our first meeting in August of 2012, you know, before that September beginning, and we realized we need to have a union of priests, a core of priests, a small core, but a core of priests, there has to be a, an organization, there has to be a unity. Then, there has to, this provides hope for the people, for the future. And then, meanwhile, we have to go around the same mass in many places. Why? In order to encourage the priests. The priest, several priests told me, Father, I want, to, I want to fight against Bishop Filet. I don't agree with what he's doing. But, where's my parish? How am I going to survive? Because remember, priests are human beings also. And so we have to do this work and say, no, you can survive. We were hoping that some local priests will come over. Many priests, so many priests have, have come so close to joining us. But because of that lack of certitude about an organization, about a place to stay, about stability, they won't come. Other thing we're having also is that many priests, like the faithful, many priests want to come on the condition that they don't have to do the circuit. They don't want to do the circuit. Those old 80-year-old priests in the 70s, they went all over the place. Father Cummins here, Father Normandon in Canada, my own pastor, Father Hannafin, so many other priests all over the world, going all over the place. The Young Society priests in the beginning were globetrotters. Now the New Society priests, forget it. They don't want to do that. They've changed. And so we have more priests, but we don't have more priories. And we have more priories, more priests. We don't have more chapels. We don't have more schools. We don't have a growth. And this has been going on for over 20 years now. So, I mean, um, we have to, um, I mean, we just have to respond. We have to have confidence in Providence. We didn't know last year you'd have this many masses as you had. First, you've got to make the leap of faith. Then God gives the help. Now, what, is, what have you noticed? I've been asking in each place, what are the things that you notice or you see here in Tainong, for instance? Do you see any serious changes or run down, running down of society or say now, five years ago, ten years ago? Well, Father, I haven't been in Tainong for long. Mm -hmm. I'd say seven down eight years. Right. But as I started there first, the message and the preaching was a greater belief to what it is today. It's mm. been watered down. They're sidetracking, they're not getting at the issue. Mm -hmm. They're not giving us a sermon that we say, oh, it's keeping the crowd happy. It's not bumping them off the seat. When he gave a sermon last Sunday about moral and dress, they all went outside and the noise was as rowdy as it was last week. Sorry, you're at the church, a house of prayer. If you want to make a racket, go down this road. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't try it in a mosque. They wouldn't try it in any other place. That's where then it starts to offend because the young ones are learning to think that that is their right to do that. And what about seven years ago? Was it loud? It was not ever? like that. It was a, a real reverence. That hit me the hardest. Leaving Nova Sporta and I came to Tainan and it left me so deeply shocked that I heard a hymn that I heard in Lourdes for 20 years, Father. 
and I was hit deep in that church that the choir sang so beautifully. But you know what they do now? They play two hymns at the end of the 8 o'clock mass. They can't play the number three and the number four. Mm -hmm. What are you there for? Mm -hmm. Sorry, you're shortchanging Our Lady, you're shortchanging God. End of story. And that's what offends me now. Mm -hmm. What are some things other people have noticed? Well, it's yes. been modern all along, but we were just riding along with it. We didn't realise, you know, because even with the school, I mean, it's just a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've never got off the ground. It, 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 you know, you hear about the German society schools, and they're, right. they're pretty solid, and uh, the Tainons always had a liberalness about it. Oh, the they've schools. always been liberal in Germany. Always. Well, compared to here, according to what you hear, right. things are a lot much more liberal in this parish and in the school. It's, it's just, it's just totally. Liberal. Well, what about like with dress? You know, normally like in America, for instance, you know, we're oh, really strict. We're, we're really strict about your ladies wearing their dresses and you know, five no, thousand babies right. and all that. But what about here? How was that here? Very good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't say when I first came to uh, Tyne from England ten years ago, when you turned up to the school, you would never see a woman wearing jeans. Or trousers, you call them pants, but now it's quite commonplace. Are you at the school? Doesn't they turn up school? Probably if you don't. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that'll be a death penalty in my school. <laughs> 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 the first time I've seen pink box in church, too. I've always Right, right. Right, right, right. Yeah. I remember when one of the ladies had a huge, right, right, right. I remember one of the ladies. If he, she was a Sadie Vicantist, so she used to bring her kids to our school. I noticed that Sadie Vicantist and the Feniites, all those type of people, they're always more liberal about dress and those kind of things, you know. As long as you believe there's no pope, you can pretty much do whatever you want. And as long as you, as long as you believe in the in, in the one baptism, you can do anything you want. So as long as you believe in the baptism, as long as you believe there's no pope, then anything goes. And so I, I've noticed that they very often, extremely common that you know they're always in their jeans and whatever, but the state of the country, so it's okay. So what? So I remember one of the families that had their kid in our school. And said, Father, I, I don't agree about the dress thing. I said, you don't have to agree. You just have to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> I don't really care if you agree. <laughs> right? And, and so the, and then, and then actually she was happy about that. And she, then she started agreeing. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and so the, uh, but you see, we used to not allow those. It's, of course, visitors, you know, new people coming, somebody comes to Mass the first time, somebody visiting, you know, we don't, you know, but, but you're talking about regular people, people that actually are members of the school, people that are actually connected with the school regularly. Those kind of people are coming with their... But there's there's been an increase in the degree of clericalism right. in, the, in the school and, and those who run it, and I think the resistance would do well to take note of that because um, it seems that um, we're there to serve the clergy rather than the clergy to serve us. Right, that's something I've heard, I've heard perpetually. I mean, in fact, one of, the three, one of the lay people told me in, in Benita, because I don't know what happened, Father, but it used to be the priest was there to serve us. Now we're there to serve the priest. I don't know when it changed, but something happened. I mean, we all understand that we're all here to serve yeah. the marching God and the priest are there to help us right. serve the marching God. But at the end of the day, we are not there to serve the clergy. That's right. And I think that's, it's, it's very important. Yeah, and even though, of course, obviously there's hierarchy in the church, you're supposed to obey them, etc. Like you're supposed to obey the Pope. But the Pope is a servus servorum dei. Yes. He is a servant of the servants of God, or the slave of the slaves of God, is the correct yeah. translation. And, yes, go ahead. I was just going to say that I uh, learned that the school received money from the government. And, is that true? Yeah, yeah. the yeah. You have to teach certain, um, uh, they, uh, Father Angeli told me Sorry, many years ago. Uh, Father Angeli said he got the school legalized. He gave me the history of the school. I don't remember. This is a long time ago when he first came over to Canada from here. And he gave me the, the history of the school and all that kind of thing. But one thing he said was that the law required all these things. So that the law, in order to be a legal school in Australia, you had to teach some of this baloney. Oh, okay. If they didn't have federal funding, they wouldn't they have to do it. Have a school. No, no. Well, yeah, they wouldn't have federal funding, but they wouldn't have a school. No. So we had to follow that line to 
Oh, well, in America, if you get federal funding, you've got to do teach their crap also. Just nobody gets federal funding. In America? We just live and we just have, although we have our ladies, so I remember in our school in Denver, for instance, the, the lady teaches all day and she works all night. Because I'm not paying her. That's still now. And, you know, and so, you know, because I, I pay her like a thousand bucks a month, maybe. They live in starvation. And they would, they would uh, work night jobs in order to be able to keep the school going. And, uh, you know, and they have absolute poverty. They don't always have food. Uh, you know, they know the school can't pay. Some months they couldn't pay everybody, and so they just didn't get paid. But they wanted to keep that school going no matter what. And they sacrificed everything. Yes. I totally agree with that. Yeah. What? I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a total sellout, isn't it? Yeah. To, to change, to say, oh, the school wouldn't survive if we, if we didn't have government funding. I mean, for crying out loud. No, that's a sellout of the faith. No. That's, that's, that's hypocrisy, really. Now, I remember one time in Denver, for instance, we were $100,000. We had to pay 100000 bucks in like one month. I said, how am I going to pay 100000 we got to pay 100000 bucks. The last time I saw $10, I was real happy. <laughs> how am I going to pay 100000 you know. And then I was preaching a retreat in Phoenix. A guy came from Texas, I think it was. And he said, I don't want to make a donation to something to your school. I said, yeah, no problem. How much do you want to donate? He said, 100000 bucks. I said, yeah, we can take that. <laughs> <laughs> that and, uh, and so it was, he donated it, and it was gone in five minutes. <laughs> the, the school didn't close. <laughs> And so, you know, God always provides, you know. When we also, we had our the secretary, you know, we always had, we always had like $1,000 in the bank and $55,000 a bill to pay every month. But I thought everybody lived that way. And that's the American dream. I don't know what it is over here. <laughs> but I mean, you know, and so you pay off $55,000 worth of bills with 1000 bucks. That's no big deal. <laughs> but you see, it's whether it's a necessity to you or not, that's the thing. See, if you can't live without it, you find a way to get it. For instance, when was the last time a beggar stole drugs? When was the last time he stole a cigarette? And when was the last time that he stole booze? And when was the last time he got a job? <laughs> he never gets a job. He never steals any of those things. And he always has the money. Because <laughs> if you need something, you somehow are going to find a way to get it. And, so, and that's why, it's, how much of a necessity is it? And I remember, we used to have all the, in the past, you know, and then we used to make fun of these teachers too, but our little teachers, our young teachers, struggling, they were not stupid. When our kids came out of our little bitty schools in America, all of them mocked. They always excelled in whatever college they went to. They chose to go to college. They always were at the top of every class. Always. And we thought they were idiots. Right? <laughs> And so, you know, so the, because, so that the fact is, but again, I think what happened is somehow it's, oh, we can't, say it's true that that's a cop-out. It's true that it is. I thought there were laws here, because, you know, America is a little more lax in the laws, you know, not anymore, but it was. We don't have any laws, really. You can start a school anywhere. And so in Australia, they said similar. You could start a school, you just couldn't have the government funding. That's right. And if they have government approval... You start a school because there are certain regulations you have to meet regardless because I actually help get the school going. Yeah, because I thought, I thought it was very strict in the beginning. It's only how you want your funding to come in. So one of the issues that was raised way back then was we have private funding sources, but it was not back because they wanted to launch themselves. So we had sources from the Philippines that would pay. Right. No, no, we don't want that. It's my way or the highway, I was told. So. But okay, so, so, there, so there was another way... Because I'm sure the law, I know the laws are more strict here than they are in America. Yeah. Yeah, more the laws here about regulation, especially when it concerns probity, governance, health and safety, that sort of thing. If you don't want their funding, you still have to meet those other regulations. Well, that'll be like light bulbs and bathrooms and stuff like that. I know, it's the whole behavior thing, and then you can't, you know. Yeah, you got to sign up, we're not going to discriminate, you know, blah, blah, blah. You can, yeah, you can't corporal punishment, all that sort of stuff. Oh, okay, yeah, that's okay, sure, right, right. Hey? Evolution. Well, evolution sucks, but apart from that, <laughs> they tell you what they teach. You got to teach evolution? Yeah. yeah. But they teach you in a way they teach. They do teach it. 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 They do
But they're not teaching them in the sense that they make it. I mean, you've got to yeah, yeah, what's wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no, no, we're going to be accurate. Wrong. But to teach wrong that it's right. No, 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 no. But if they're teaching it's wrong, then at least they're teaching it's wrong. Yeah, right? but don't but father, don't forget. Yeah. That's the worst. That's the worst when they teach it to a young one. They don't forget. That's true. So it's when they get out in that wilderness out there, oh, they go so with the bread. And then also comes to parenting. My kids go to the Sisters No Mercy, whatever they call the thing in Lilydale. It's completely modern school. But they've learned to write through you know, what I've taught them. Now, according to the theory of evolution, this is so. Yeah, right. They know that it's not so. So I've taught them how to answer the questions to get the marks, but know inside that it's just bulldust. Right. So you can teach them to get around it. And, um, well, that's good parenting in one sense. But, yeah, uh, that's. It is, it is clumsy and it's difficult. No, yeah, well, that's, that's bad. See, the difference that the Catholics do is um, they don't do it to Muslims, they don't do it to any of the Hindu type groups. It's just that we as Catholics are traditionally we have water when it comes to telling the government. You're going to say, no, this is our faith. And they actually can't make you do it. You've got to consent to it. So yeah, but you don't. To you don't. You don't do that. You know what? You know what? We have. A, you should get. Uh, uh, you can get it on the internet, buried somewhere. The catechism called the Sincere Christian by Bishop George Hay it was written in 1783, so it's a few years ago. Uh, was that 220 years, 30 years? And uh, he has an appendix, two appendix that were very good appendices. One of them is outside the church is no salvation. It's a very long appendix, very excellent. And then the last one is why there can no Catholics cannot have communion with false religions. And he is excellent there to point out that the obligation of the Catholic, according to the gospel, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. Now notice, what Bishop George Hay says, notice what it says. Not if you confess me or deny me. Anyone can confess Christ in his heart or deny Christ in his heart. That is not what the gospel says. If you confess me before men, in other words, publicly, if you do not confess me before men, I will not confess you before the Father. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. So therefore, what matters is what we do before men, which means in public. Catholics are obliged to confess before men in public because they cannot be known what is held secretly. So if they tell us about evolution, you've got to tell them it's full of crap and they're going to hell. Mm -hmm. And that's what my kids find in classrooms. Yeah. It's in the exams they run. It's right. up, I think. In the classroom, I'm often getting calls. Your son or daughter has said this, and your problem is... <laughs> right, right. Right, so and that's good. Arguing with the yeah, but so and so you see, that's why you know this is what this is what the problem with the new society situation is. We're going to try the nice guy approach. We're going to not condemn Vatican II. We're going to not condemn the errors. And Bishop Fillet told me that himself in in October of 2011. He came to the Philippines, and of course I was stationed in the Philippines, and he came down, and it was the time of Assisi. And we were having a big thing against the season number three. And he said, I'm not speaking against the season number three. I said, why not? Why are you not speaking against season number three? Why are you not speaking? Because I am making an agreement and talks with Rome. Since I'm with talks with Rome, I cannot be saying negative things publicly. So therefore, I'm letting the other priests, like Father de Cacre, who was with him at the time. I'm letting Father de Cacre say the negative things, but I'm not saying the negative things. To me, he's not going to say negative things. That is his obligation. And so when you, when you, uh, when you say, oh, now Bishop Blaise has got a new tactic, he's not going to say negative things, well, that is contrary to the teaching of the gospel. And so this is an essential shift. That's assuming that he's not a, an error or not a heretic. But unfortunately, he has already expressed error, the error and heresy of modernism. He's expressed it. And so therefore we can't tolerate it. The error must be condemned. It's not about Bishop Filet being a bad person. It's about the evil of what his teaching is. And that teaching must be condemned. He's also doing evil acts which must be condemned. Such as the uh, refusing of Father Pino to celebrate Mass even privately. And to take away his priesthood. Because he criticized the Superior General in a letter. He didn't criticize him. He did the spell check on a letter to criticize him. 
and therefore he has to receive the most severe penalty that can be received. That's very gravely unjust, very gravely evil. And uh, we can't uh, accept those kinds of things. But what's far more important is we can't accept the change of the doctrine. Have you seen these kinds of changes in the parish here? Have you seen, you say it's been a struggle since the beginning, kind of. But, but people, a lot of people have moved here. A lot of people put their kids in the school. Teaching, yeah. And the school also teaching, what's that word? The you teaching know, what? Faiths are okay. What's it? Ecumenism. That's it. What's it called? Ecumenism. They're teaching that in the schools. Well. But also in the school. Are well, they required, how much, of, what, are they teaching the whole curriculum? Are they required to teach? Do they have a full yeah. curriculum given by the government? Yeah. They have a curriculum, I've studied the curriculum. The, the Victorian curriculum allows you to put things in it that reflect your faith and ethos. You've only got to do it. If you consent to teaching something else, that's your choice. The curriculum guidelines are written so widely that you can teach Catholicism and not be punished and still get the, the Catholic money. That, that, that's absolute bullshit that you have to teach their stuff to get the money. You only have to teach their curriculum, and it will say things like, you have to teach origins, current theories are, but somewhere else it says, but you don't have to teach it if it's your faith. Don't expect them to believe it universally, but it's only in that school. The Victorian guidelines are very cleverly written. That's why the Muslims get around it, the Buddhist law, everybody else gets around it. It's just we that give in because we're stupid for some reason. Or we haven't thought it through. And also oh, so it's actually legal to not teach evolution. You don't have to teach it. Yeah, that's correct. You, know, right. you can get around it. Uh, you've got to be clever how you do it. But also in the history of the school, there are a lot of people attending um, the so-called indult masses. Right. You know, I remember having arguments with a few people down there at the society. The school opened and they flooded the place, of course. Right. Which is great for numbers, but they suddenly arrived without ever being in an SSBX chapel, being full of all of the stuff that's come out of the archdiocese. So it's also coming from the people that are attending. You know, they, they've arrived there without ever being in the SSPX or tradition. They've come there because it's a school. I understand there's a lot of communication in this parish between the indoor people and the, our people, that there's a lot of... Well, up at Hampton, there are people there who are proud. They say they're sport for choice. They've got here, they've got St. Aloysius, which is FSSP, local nervous order. They're very happy about it, which is very sad. What's the general reaction to the parish, though? Well, the people Nobody come because they want their children to get an education. That's why they come. Mm. Well, not many. Handful, just there's a handful of here, yeah. <laughs> But the thing is, you must get, some of the priests must complain about that. Uh-huh. Not anymore. No, no, not anymore. They used to. Yeah, yeah it was talked to his wife, I never heard him. He just feel that whole thing would become very slack. He doesn't the really school school's been badly run now. I mean, they'll let anything go for a particular family. Your kid does something under the, uh, under the carpet. A couple of years ago, they had a, a whole class into pornography, except for two students. And, and the whole thing got exposed and it got brushed under the carpet. Nothing said, nothing done about it. And that became known in the parish? I got around, I don't know who, how many, but it was kind of right under the carpet, but it's a who's who place for it. But what about the doctrinal, because, you know, we've got a, a, what do you call it, um, a, um, I mean, what do you see as the, um, I mean, do you see a challenge in the in the faith? Uh, do you see a change? And these are things, I guess, are practical things about, you think they're just trying to keep the numbers up, or? Uh, well, numbers are important to a point. Because it's government funding, how many people you've got in the queue? But at the same time, there's a lot of families just pulling out and going back to other schools, you know. Or they're, they're not, there's, every year, there's two or three big families pulling out. There's other families don't know what to do. Like they, it's like they probably don't know whether to come here either. Some of them, but they're not. Um, they're all confused, don't know where to go, what to do. They're dependent on the society. Right. I think, I think even the nuns. I mean, I don't only hear bits and pieces. I don't know personally. The truth, but I believe the nuns are probably not happy either. But they got they depend on the society. So yeah, the nuns are. Sister Mother Michaela has been put into a great trap. Yeah, she doesn't have a. She can't even have a bank account as it used to be. <laughs> what is she? Right, that's where it was in New Zealand. She couldn't even have a bank account. Uh, they have her, which of course she must have. It's very important for the independence of the convent, right? You know, she needs to be. But they so they, they don't own the property. They don't own anything. They don't have any rights. And they're not even considered sisters mm-hmm. by Bishop Fillet. So you see, it's it's just like a it's like a you know it's like a noose tied around on all sides. 
And meanwhile, she really does well, I mean, in, in all of the adversity that she's had to deal with. Mm. And, and yet, Sidney, well, she's, a real, she's a real nun. She's not a fake nun. She's a real nun. And, she's, and she actually is from a convent founded by somebody called St. Dominic, a real Dominican. The Dominicans in Ponjo were not founded by St. Dominic. They were founded by another lady in the 1800s. And they became affiliated with the Dominicans. But her order is actual Dominicans that come from St. Dominic. Yeah. Yeah, but didn't she apply to Rome to come under Bishop Felix? So no, people. no, no, no. Are you kidding? So, uh, <laughs> what is, was, um, no, Bishop, Bishop Fillet was against everything. Christopher Ermey adopted it. He said that. Um, no, they didn't, didn't do that. Maybe they did it now. No, they didn't do it. Oh, yeah, they didn't like to go to school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got to go to school. How are they doing? Well, <laughs> yeah. They'll be trying to make it yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, um, the, uh, but in any case, you know, um, the, uh, uh, no, but the thing is that, um, I don't know what we were saying there. The thing I'd like to ask too, Father, what support do we give to the nuns? And then they were collecting there a couple of weeks back. Well, I think I, I know sisters and mothers in a difficult situation. She's trying her best. I think she's got they've got a lot of vocations there. We sent some girls to her, um, and um, you know I think they've got a good spirit. The convent's got a good spirit. I think they they, they live the rule, as far as I know, and they, you know they like I said visited multiple times. Now, of course, you know it's a death penalty. But when uh, they move back to. But the problem with it is, is they're accepting the challenges. This. They're accepting the new dire direction of Bishop Vallee, and that's unacceptable. So we got to, we got to, So I, I wouldn't support them now because they, they, they don't stand in the right spot. Now I know Mother Michaela and the sisters are in a very difficult position, and so it's very hard for them. Um, but at the same time, you know, it is uh, they, they've got to. You know, there has been a change, of, and I think they're they're not telling the truth. Oh, we haven't changed. Everything's the same. You know, the sisters, like religious, they don't get all the information. That they're not allowed to. They can't just read things. No, no. They have to get permission and all that sort of thing, right? So, so their their information is very blocked. You know, very limited. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, somebody very close to Mother Michaela. Yeah. I was talking to her. And I, I I mentioned these things what's happening around, and she said, "I'll go to Mother Michaela with this stuff." And she comes back and tells me, Michaela, Mother Michaela says it's all not true. <laughs> so I, I don't, I'm not too sure that she does. She's just ignorant to what, what's happening. And yeah, I think she doesn't believe there's a change because he's been told there's no change, right? <laughs> now, of course, you're going to need to read and study. I sent her a note telling her the things to read and study. I, I got no response, um, you know, that she had needed to read and study. I think she was told that we're just following Bishop Williamson. She sent me a brief note last year saying, I think you're backing the wrong horse. Oh. <laughs> right? You're backing the wrong horse. Backing the wrong horse, which means, you know, it's like a personal type of thing. Yeah. Uh, so that might be what she thinks. And, you know, and they're just keeping her maybe a little bit in the dark. Uh, but no, she's very, Mother Bakila is very good. And, uh, you know, everybody's got their imperfections and challenges. You know, she's a tough, tough lady. But she's a good sister. And, uh, and the, um, uh, I think it's an unfortunate situation. They're more victims, really. But what are they going to do? They, they have their, they don't have a property. They don't have an existence. They don't have anything. They are totally 150% in the hands of the whim of Bishop Vallee. How are the sisters in Germany called then? Uh, they have their own convent. They own their own convent. In America. Uh, and so they moved out. They were not allowed to sell it, but they owned it. That's their property. But in front of the Kayla, no, not, not her property. She doesn't have anything. This time she appeared in Thailand. Normally she should. She should normally, but she doesn't. Yeah. This time she appeared in Thailand. She made the talk of the Dominicans. Yeah. It's all about how bad Vatican II was and the whole thing. Right. And everyone was a bit shocked about it, I think. But right. since then, she's, they've all quietened down, but it's nothing like that ever said. Right, right. So a lot of those, Father, once they profess to full profession and none, mm -hmm. do they go back to, say, Philippines, India, 
and that, that they can then start and say... Well, no, 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 they're under, they stay until there's a, a condom established. So, no, they, they don't go back. They have to be where the mother puts them. And then, well, if she established, right now they only have two places on the planet Earth. Wanganui and here. Huh. She's known, excuse me, Father, she's known as Mother General. <laughs> she is the Mother General. Who, yeah. By who, who supported the Mother General? She is the mother of the organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. But who was born to how, how, how did it come about, Father? It's, it's because she founded a convent as a Dominican. She had the right yeah. to do that. Yeah. See, remember, there's a, there has been a council, and the council is straight from hell. And uh, there still has a right to be sisters and brothers and monks and priests. And you, she could not accept being a mother general of a Novus Ordo with a Novus Ordo bishop's approval. She couldn't do that and be Catholic. She's Catholic. She, she stayed a faithful Dominican. And in order to be a faithful Dominican, she had to be expelled basically from the mainstream order. And in order to maintain her fidelity... She needed to get other girls to come with her, and then she's the mother. That's what she is. That's what she told me. Well, at the she moment, Father, they're collecting money to build a convent for them, and they want each family to pay almost a thousand dollars. Well, that's good, but the problem with it is, is who's going to own the convent? I don't think who's she's going to own the convent. The convent and where the family's going they to own the convent. convent's going to be owned by the SSPX, I believe. Not by her. That's fine. Yeah, well, why it should, should be owned by her. Why should they build another convent to go to men's things? I mean, it's not right. No, you shouldn't support it, not because the sisters are good sisters, but you shouldn't support it because, unfortunately, they're on the wrong team right now. Because they're, they're, they, they, I don't think they fully understand what's happening. They're victims. But the fact is that they are accepting the new position of the society by being with the society, which accepts that the new mass is legitimately promulgated and accepts that Vatican II is acceptable, and then we need to make a deal with Rome. So all those things are unacceptable. So, I mean, they're good sisters, they're good ladies, uh, but unfortunately they're in a bad situation. Yeah. How can she be rescued out of this situation? Well, you know, first of all, she has to see that there's a problem. So that's up to us. Well, you can if talk to her. You've got to tell her. But again, again, you know, she's going to be hard, you know. It's going to be difficult. You can talk to her. You've got to speak with her. Um, and, uh, you know, but it's, it's going to take a grace. It's not easy at all because she's, she's got all those sisters. They're all dependent on her. And she's tied. She's tied all, you know, she's tied in. It's not easy. Not at all easy. She can't abandon what she has there. Yes. And that's the hard part. Right. Yeah. I ask. But also, I don't think she fully understands the problem. But again, it takes grace to see that. It, it, remember, it takes the grace of God. Yeah. We're in a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great crisis right now, and it's going to take the grace of God to get through it. Yeah. I found, Father, in December, I had to go through operation. And a friend from Tana, who I really relied on because I'm on my own, had in contact and he said to me, why wasn't I at Mass? And I said, I was, because we had had a Mass here. Next thing he said, oh, you're with that lot. And I left it at that because I said, no. Because he was trying to say the thing, what happened with Bishop Taylor. I said, no, nothing to do with it. I'm with Bishop Lafayette. And continued through with that. So they can't answer on what the problem is mm -hmm. today with the Archbishop mm -hmm. fellow thing, because that's the one they'll throw at me, right? right? But none of them said to me, John, what operation did you have, and for how long? <laughs> they weren't interested in that. They said, oh, thank goodness he's still here alive, he'll pay the next bill. <laughs> oh, yeah. right. So, sorry, if the person's got to be used for that, they're not really following what's got to be charity, is it? Right. Right. Oh, it doesn't matter, I'm through. Hope I don't have another one for now, the two years. Right. Right. That's important. The old folk, we've lost their friend. But what about, what's, what's the, what do you say is the overall spirit in the parish? I mean, because uh, some of you have been here for many years, right? You see we were there at the beginning when, when Father Angeli came and, and started the... Uh... Well, my experience is I, I came, quote, to tradition, unquote, in 1991 or something. Right. And um, so my experience was, yeah, this is different. I found at that time Father Angeli to be, you know, 
tough and whatever. And for those that know me, my price that I paid to come to Rishi wasn't a cheap one. Right. So I think we were doing sort of fine. I mean, we didn't hear any of the background stuff. Um, and at Hampton at the time, it was standing room only three streets down. There were so many people turning up there. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, timing opened, so that, that changed it. So down here, I really don't know what's going on. But at uh, Hampton, it's relatively quiet now. Uh, when Father Doran was there, um, he was trying to get us all motivated. His view was there are you know, four million Melbournians there, let's go get them. Right. And then when Father Black came, I went out and had lunch with him basically. He said, what are you going to do? And he said, nothing. <laughs> you know? right. And I think that's what's happened. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah, 100% yeah. success rate in doing no. that. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, There's no um, converts. We don't see any converts. Well, you used to before. Well, even Father Laney, when he was there, he held various shows, you know, putting up you know, the shroud and, and stuff, and right. dragging people in and taking out. So we're having some effect. We've got right. converts, but the last years, it's, you hear the crickets. Right. What about in Tainan? Because uh, it was a parish growing here. Because sometimes the school, my people come in and out. There's always going to be somebody unhappy with the school, even if it's a good school. There's going to always be unhappy parents. That's unavoidable. Um, but you have. But but with regard to the uh, the growth of the parish here, has it been stable? Is it grown? Is it shrinking? I mean, what's what's the situation here? I think in the last two years with these same numbers, but what I found, Father, what they do wrong here through the week. On a Thursday they have football practice. Now if they're so in their faith, why not change the Thursday night to a Wednesday night when they have mass, rosary and benediction, mm. which are the three greatest gifts right. in the church. To put it to them, I don't think they'd even listen to me. I've asked, often asked different things from them. As I said to them when I first started, I said, how do we stand with Rome? Oh, it's not an issue. Sorry, I've just come out of the other lot. Mm -hmm. They were all happy waving to see me goodbye, but this lot said, oh, no, it's not an issue. So they've got the days wrong when you've <coughs> got to bring the young ones to the church. Mm -hmm. It's no good us old ones. We're going out. Right. If you don't bring the young ones in, so I'm in the closed door. Full stop. But I mean, uh, it, so you say the fair is more or less the same as two years ago, yeah. more or less. Yeah. But uh, what's interesting on that, you know, so um, to follow up just before, uh, I'm uh, not in a completely traditional household. My wife's a local pastoral worker and stuff in the Novus Ordo, and so that causes great conflict. Right. One of the issues is where my children are going to get their sacraments. So uh, one of the priests down at the uh, society, uh, a well-known vocal priest who's probably in Queensland, but I don't really know who it is, advised that the kids can choose to go to the Novus Ordo if they want to. So one of my children was confirmed locally. Okay. <laughs> right. So that's the advice we're getting from uh, too, which is just... You said it's okay to go to the Novus Ordo? If the kids choose to. Uh, hang on, I thought I was the dad. <laughs> but right, then, right. There's, so uh, there's that undermining going on as well. Right, right. So then must have something happened. Father O'Case gave us the direction last time that we'll come to it to the point when we are rejected, if you really feel it, right. that we have to start at home and wait for the next time a priest comes. Well, I think one thing to do is you should meet on Sundays. Yeah. yeah you should meet like at a place like this or another place. Yeah. In fact, I think some of you are doing that already, right? Yeah, don't worry. I'm on Sundays. Yeah. So you should meet on Sundays. It's important. Uh, you have like an hour, you know, say to the rosary, read the prayers, and have a little catechism for the kids or something, and then just a, you know, a little whatever, you know, coffee and donuts or whatever. But I know myself when I started in Tano, they had the bulletin. It had the most important things on it, and it will always have at the bottom the writing of a saint. Wow. But now you've got a whole thing about who is going to be the little choir boy and the carrying boy, this and that. A full page. Who wants to hear commercials? Mm -hmm. You can get that on TV and everywhere. Mm -hmm. Keep religion to religion. Excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Father, I recently had one of the priests at Tainon phone me up and ask to see me. And he came over that same afternoon to ask my involvement in the resistance. Mm -hmm. And it was actually due to the fact that I had given some good friends of ours a copy of the Australian Australasian Declaration 
to yeah. read. Mm -hmm. um, because he wasn't aware of all the facts. So father, this father spent an hour and a half with me in my home. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately I was not well enough to be completely switched on. But he gave the standard party line mm -hmm. answers to me regarding mm -hmm. what the SSPX were doing. Mm -hmm. um, some of his answers I found were not correct. Mm -hmm. And I referred him back to uh, certain sources that I had already read, um, including Bishop Tissier's biography of the Archbishop. Mm -hmm. So he could at least see that what he was saying, hopefully he could see, is not correct. Um, and he also mentioned the fact that he couldn't understand why some people in the resistance were still attending Mass at Tynal. And he said the reason why they haven't said anything to us from the pulpit is because he's hoping that it will make it easier for us to stay or to go back to Tainan. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's a battle tactic. Well, the talk did the machine gun, um, you know, nuclear bomb, <laughs> nuclear grenade tactic. Um, and uh, that didn't really work. Um, and uh, so now they're trying another tactic, the nice guy tactic, which generally is a more effective uh, like, like Shakespeare said in Henry V, when lenity and cruelty vie for a kingdom, the gentlest gangster is the soonest winner. And, uh, you know, so it's, you know, it's, um, it's a good tactic. Uh, a better tactic is just to focus on the doctrine, the truth. Um, but when, you, when, you, when you're dealing with people, many people just respond to who's nice and who's not nice. Well, he avoided it. In fact, he said, I, I prefer not to speak about um, those specific things. Mm -hmm. But so he gave the standard answers what we're hearing. Well, one of the, it's one of the challenges. The proper way to deal with this situation, there's talk of a deal with Rome, union with Rome. There's, 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 a, there's a new doctrinal declaration. It says that uh, we accept these six conditions under which we'll go into Rome. And we accept the new mass and legitimately promulgated and so on. The proper way to deal with that is, okay, faithful, we're now saying to Rome the new mass is legitimately promulgated. Here's what we mean by that. Legitimately promulgated means that the Pope has the power to make legitimate promulgations. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we accept this new mass as legitimate. Now they think that it means that it's legitimately promulgated, but we don't really mean for it to mean that. We mean it to mean something else. And so that they give their, even if it's a lame explanation, give some kind of explanation. Then explain how we used to have this old policy, which was not going to have anything to do with modernist Rome until Rome converts. And now we have a new policy, and we real, because we have to recognize it's going to take many generations for Rome to convert, and we're going to have to work slowly on the conversion of Rome. Here's the old teaching and why we have to change it. Here's the new teaching and why it's right. That's the way to properly work. But instead, what they're doing is, well, there's no real new teaching, but then they teach it. And so if you say there's no new teaching, when you refute the new teaching, they say we're not teaching it. And then they continue to teach it. <laughs> Playing games, going back and forth. And so that, that's, that's what's happening. So they're playing games, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so, uh, you know, we just can't play those kind of games, you know. So, the, but the proper thing is teach the new teaching, explain what the old teaching is wrong, be open and clear. That's what I said in the Fed did in 88. I remember 87 88. We need to consecrate four bishops. Why are we doing this? For the preservation of the Catholic priesthood and the, we're not going to leave you orphans. There's going to be priests for the future. There's going to be Catholic confirmations. There's going to be a continuation of the Catholic seminary. There's going to be a hope for Catholic tradition for the future. Therefore, we must do this in order to preserve the Catholic faith. Some people say we shouldn't be doing it. Well, they're wrong. They're wrong because we're doing what's necessary for the good of the church, and the church gives us multiple explanations and reasons why it's right to do these, excommunicate, do, do these uh, consecrations, and there'll be no excommunication attached to it because of Canon 1323, paragraph 1, Canon 1323, paragraph 2, etc. And so various arguments and explanations were made, and the people were catechized, and they were explained why it was important to do these consecrations. It was open and clear. And there are reasons given. And if you don't follow it, then go ahead and join the new society and Father Bishop's going to be starting. And uh, so people decided. 
uh, based on the teaching. And they were explained. Now we're, we're changing direction. They're saying, oh, we're not changing. And we're not going to explain anything to you. Just trust the superiors. It's very, even if they, what they were doing was objectively acceptable, their method or methodology of going about it is objectively unacceptable. It's not Catholic. It's devious. Um, and, I, and I wanted to find out what was the role of the bishops when they were consecrated bishops. Um, and I've read quotes from the Archbishop as to what he said their role was. But this particular priest uh, said that they were almost glorified priests, okay, that had no function as to just confirm and ordain. And, and ordain. Well, it's partially, like many things, it's partially true. Yeah. Uh, Archers of Lefebvre, uh, the member that said these bishops are there in order to continue the priesthood, have confirmation, make sure things go on. They don't have jurisdiction, of course. They're, however, they're still bishops, and therefore they must be involved. He said explicitly, Archers of Lefebvre said explicitly, they must, these four bishops must be involved in any future dealings with Rome, and they must all four be involved. And uh, even though they're not, they're not holding positions of authority within the society, uh, even if they have no positions of authority within the society, when the time comes when we make dealings with Rome, all four bishops must be involved. They cannot, you cannot be any working with Rome without the consultation of these four bishops. And uh, that part is left out completely. Our Bishop Williamson, Bishop Tissier, were completely left out of all the negotiations with Rome. Which was explicitly against the, the direct command of Archers of Lefebvre when he consecrated those bishops in 88. So they violated the command of Archers of Lefebvre. Uh, and it's true, however, that they're auxiliary bishops and don't have jurisdiction, and they were under the other authorities. Like, for instance, when Bishop Williamson traveled throughout Canada, throughout Australia, he was under the District Superior of Australia. Right? When he goes to the Priory, he's under the Prior, and so on. But he still has a place of honor because he's a bishop, but didn't have any authority. Okay, so that part is true well, as regards to the administration within the society. However, they are not obliged to a strict obedience because bishops are beyond that. They only obey as a kind of uh, uh, honorary type of thing, but they're not actually under obedience. <laughs> uh, but uh, they're not, they're not under a true strict obedience. And then secondly, when dealing with Rome, they had to be involved. So what he told you is partially true. Partially. Mm. That's correct. And the defenders of the faith as bishops, which is one of the reasons why they had to be involved in the dealing with Rome. Um, but um, what about the spirit of the parish? I'm not saying much about the spirit of the, spirit of the parish. Is it a happy... I think that in the schools, it's, it's reached its pinnacle two or three years ago. I wouldn't call it a great pinnacle that way. But no, I think now there's a lot of... Fam- Every year there's three or four big families taking their children out of school either to move or to put them into neighbors or those schools, or and there's quite a few people, families now in other schools around the place, because they're not happy with time on. It's to do with the spirit of the place. Apart from all the other things we're talking about, right. I think uh, the priest running it, Father Delsort, has got this very heavy weather, dominating, wants his way only type person, and has people around him who only do what he wants. Mm-hmm. When there's this sort of heavy weather over the school, uh, all the students feel like, like, no one likes being there, if you want to. Right. It's not, it's not well, those families that are saying they don't even want their kids there and they don't know what else to do. Right. And I think there's this element as well, which is now, it's all dribbling down and affecting everyone. So there's, there's a depressing, depressing feeling there. My, my children said they've never heard anything about Archbishop of Fed since they've been there. It's only when, actually, since they came to the resistance did they start to learn about it. Right. They learn about tradition and different things, but nothing about our founder. So right. that's wrong. And I, right. I, I, I just feel there's a real modernist twist now, a twist of our place, and it's coming through clearer and clearer. Right. And I think we're hearing about the meetings that we've been having since 2009, having dinners and all sorts of things with uh, local bishops, things like that. All these things have been going on behind our back um, under the guise of. Um, under the guise kind of. We're not, gonna, we're not going to give up anything traditional, but we're trying to. To see what we can do. Well, it's very different than, like, I, I, well, I've been doing that for years, visiting bishops and priests, not just in the last six years, but it was always in the old way we used to do it. 
And the bishops knew and the priests knew that when that traditional priest walked through the door, he's coming in to tell them the new mass was cracked. That he was coming in to tell them Vatican II was straight from hell. Well, they already knew what we were going to say, so there was no shock involved. <laughs> and, and then also, one thing I found very interesting, I was just telling them straight up the new mass was straight from hell in one way or another, and they were never offended by it. <laughs> partly because they knew it was true, and partly because they knew that's what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> Well, when you know. Father, when I first started in time, I was visiting the priest, and he was a Salesian in yeah. the college of Bansdale. So he saw the bulletin on the table, and I said to Father Rowley, I said, am I doing wrong? And he said, no, John, you're not. Right. To me, that meant a lot. Right. That's gone with me for a long time. But he was so, at that age, well, not many years, he was in retirement. So for him to change, which he could have done many years ago, but if your post from one place to the other as he was, from school to school to school, or where do you, as you said in previously, get into a comfortable position like a parochial house, they can work from that. But if they've got nothing, they're out in limbo. Right. And that's where then he never brought those topics up. He preferred to talk about the farm. Right. And he was the farm. Well, uh, I think right now what's very important is that we formed these chapels, even though you got mass. We got mass more than expected. You know, I didn't think it was going to make this trip, but I ended up being able to pull it off. Uh, and uh, you know, and so the uh, uh, we get the masses as often as you can. Uh, and meanwhile, meet and pray, and and then talk to the priests. You do need to talk to the priests. You've got to try to talk to them. You know, sometimes it's like a waste of time, but you need to talk to them. That's how they need to face the fact that they're. Let them answer but their, their questions, yes. I tried talking to the priest. How do I talk to you? Well, that's they true. They fast it. Right. It's a topic that won't... They should say, say we won't, won't talk about the yeah, system. Right. Leave, leave right. No, they didn't. Father Fox in particular, he was, he was quite strong, sorry. Well, Father Fox was ready to join us last year. I know. He's not now. Yeah, no. I don't know. He told me, basically, part of the problem was is that the, I was in it. <laughs> uh, that says, you know, look, I hate to be, I don't want to be offensive, but basically you're like crazy. <laughs> and Father Giselle is crazy. I said, well, that's, that's true, we are crazy. Um, excuse me? Yeah, you know, it's not that hard to figure out. And uh, But, you know, it's, it's a matter of, it's just like, um, you know, when a couple of my preachers used to say in Colorado all the time, it's not about who's right, it's about what's right. When you go from who to what, it becomes an easier and more clear choice. But who, we are a pathetic group, so that's true. And I think God allowed that in order to see who's going to stand for the truth, see? Because we don't have any positions of authority, we're just a bunch of idiots. Um, but what are we doing? We're standing for the truth. And there's where our power comes from. And it, it was always that way in society, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. When this uh, started to blow up in 2012, right. Right, I asked a pertinent question mm -hmm. to a priest um, at home, and I said to him, <coughs> I said, I'm, I'm really worried about what's happening to the SSPX. They're going down the liberal path. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, what, no, what's your opinion, Father? And he said, oh, there's no way I'm going down that path. And he said, no, I can speak for every priest here. So, but every time I tried to speak to someone, they sidestepped me. They wouldn't answer my questions. And they treated me like I was a little fruitcake. But that's true. That's another problem that even though we've got to try to talk to them openly, this is one of the signs that they're not following God that they can't answer simple questions, and when they do answer questions, they're so complicated that you don't even remember what the question was. And so the, um, they, make, they, they don't have clear answers, and right down to very simple questions. Like I've asked multiple priests in the last year and a half about the one famous sen sentence of Bishop Fillet, New Mass is only promulgated. I've asked that speak, do you believe the New Mass is only promulgated? Some of them can't answer at all. And one of them I gave a choice. You got three answers. Yes, no, and maybe. Pick one. Mm -hmm. Couldn't do it. <laughs> but, uh, yes. It hasn't been proven that it was never promulgated. 
Of course it's been proven that it's never been promulgated. It's a totally illegitimate bastard mass. It's canonically bastard. It's theologically a bastard. And uh, it's straight from hell. It does not fulfill the conditions of legitimacy. No Catholic can accept that the new mass is legitimate. It's not. You see, in order for a law to be legitimate, it has to be in conformity with the eternal law, who is God. And St. Thomas Aquinas says a very clear and beautiful thing about law. He says, what is the purpose of law? Law is a command that facilitates happiness. So, Father, purpose of law is to achieve our end, which is happiness with God in heaven. If you were preaching on the Mass, which we've been having all during Lent, would you say that the new Mass was just not as good as the Latin Mass? No, I would say it's straight from hell. <laughs> okay? So the new mass is demonic. The new mass is intrinsically evil. The new mass is causing souls to go to hell. We're not being told that. Father Hannon, my old pastor, that's what he used to do. You know, I, I was raised as an old priest, an Irish priest. We were born in America, but pure Irish. And he wasn't a deep theologian and all that. I remember uh, more than 100 priests coming to my house when I was a kid. So I was raised around a lot of priests. And Father Hannafin would all meet them all. And some of the priests would come in and say, Well, Father uh, Frank, or because they're classmates of Father Hannafin, or Father Hannafin, uh, what's wrong with the new Mass? I remember 5, 10, 15, 20 of them saying that same question. What's wrong with the new Mass? And he would give a normal Irish response. What's wrong with the new Mass? <laughs> what do you mean, what's wrong with the new Mass? It's causing souls to go to hell. Stop saying it. That was his theological argument. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't go down into the details of Patrick Henry O'More and the uh, and the, the Octavian intervention and you know the, the four different ends of the mass and the change of the words of the offertory. He just said it's causing souls to go to hell. Stop saying it. Not one of those priests, not one, disagreed with him. And I saw at least four or five of them weep. Not one disagreed. Not one had an answer. Because it is causing the soul to go to hell. <laughs> and so, and there are theological reasons for it. <laughs> we, should, we should have some knowledge of those theological reasons. But the fact is, it's causing souls to go to hell. Now when you say it's legitimate, no matter how you look at it, it means it's not causing souls to go to hell. It means it's pleasing to God. The worst you could say is maybe it's not as good as the old mass. Yes, I got that thing. Sure, that's the worst you could say. See, and you know we can't uh, accept that, right? And so priests would give a different answer. Some priests have told me the new mass is legitimate, but it just means that it is legitimately canonically uh, uh, promulgated, but not good. So Other priests are legal from this. They said it's legal, right, which is, which is stupid, like separating freedom from liberty. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, but nonetheless, so they said it's, it's legal, which is false. Some priests have told me that, SSBX priests, when we were trained otherwise in the seminary. Others have said that, well, legitimate does not mean that it's legal. It simply means that we're admitting that the Pope has the right to make laws, which is ugh, really stupid. <laughs> Well, hopefully, I believe so, uh, but I don't know when. Uh, Bishop Williamson, uh, he just got—I know he got his approval just a little short time ago. Uh, he know his visa and all the, you know, renewed his visa or whatever. I don't know when he's coming. He didn't say. Yeah. I asked previous priest about is the bishop going to consecrate other bishops right. in the resistance priest because right. he will not always be there, so. Mm -hmm. FR is it into that that you know about? Well, I, I don't think so. Not in the foreseeable future. I think that uh, Bishop Williamson says our Sister Lafayette was 83 or something, and he's only 74. <laughs> so he's got nine years. <laughs> I, I don't think he's any big hurry. Yeah. And, uh, it is important. Uh, no, it is important. I, I think it's very important because, because of the fact that we need to have a you know, people, we need to have a stability, a stability. Uh, and uh, particularly with the world changing as fast as it is, yeah. uh, there's a lot of changes going on in the world, and they're negative changes, yeah. not positive ones. And so, uh, but then again, you know, I think, you know, I think that 
you know, there's uh, Mr. Williams under a lot of pressure. And I think that, uh, you know, there's maybe some bad advisors there. Everybody's got different advice. And, uh, the, but again, it's, I think that God's allowing this confusion or this weakness that's going on right now in order to see who's willing to stand up without that security. Father, the positive yes. is coming soon, the consecration of Russia. Every day it's soon. That's true. Every day we're getting closer. That's true. Peace in the world. Yes, that is correct. And we don't know, obviously we can't know the day or the hour, yeah, but we know what's happening. And uh, we, know, think, we also know that everything's going to get worse between now and then. Uh, so, but God will not leave us abandoned. He will make sure that we're taken care of somehow. My father come and said in Streaky Bay there, you know, uh, you know, whenever I'm needed, I'll not be far away, you know. And that's what happened so many times. And every priest has experienced that. I've experienced it. It's been experienced many times. You know, like even this last year, a lady could make sure that she conveniently died when I could be there. <laughs> and it was impossible. One of, it was a lady who wasn't even one of our full-time parishioners in the past. I was just closely connected with her formally. She didn't even go to Mass all the time. But she wanted to make sure that Father Pfeiffer anointed her. And I did. And it happened because of plane, because I missed the plane. Because the plane was delayed. So I went up and saw her. And she didn't even know she was. I knew she was sick. I didn't know she was dying. I went to see her and she was dying. So I anointed her. Then, the next trip, I came through another stupid plane problem. And I went up to see her again, and she died that night. And so, you know, and so that the, um, uh, uh, it's absolutely impossible in our present circumstances. Absolutely impossible. But guess what? It happened. And the fact is that God is going to provide. He always, he always has, and He always will. We just have to have faith. And uh, so, you know, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, we've got baptisms, we've got marriages, we've got, uh, you know, a couple of funerals uh, and some anointings, um, you know, and so uh, already we've seen that in the last year and a half, already. Yes? What are our chances of getting a family priest in Australia? Zilch. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> All right. However, you never know. God will, uh, I think, you know, God will provide right now. And I, I think one thing is very strong, the fact that you're, you've, you've got a strong standing in this country without a permanent priest. That's a very, very, very good thing. Because remember, I mean, I know Australia is physically huge, you know, it's 100 million miles by 100 million miles with a whole bunch of kangaroos running around and koalas. <laughs> um, but... Population, it's a small country, really. This is, the land is so big. And in this country, which population is relatively small, we have a really strong showing, really. Uh, and, uh, you know, and look at these. And also what happens? Because you've got people in Brisbane, people in, uh, you know, Sydney here, and in Spiky Bay, and Adelaide, and now Wanganui over in New Zealand, and, you know, and so in Perth. Uh, because of that, there's a God will provide. I don't know when, but maybe for a while, the Father Suzelle and I have to keep flying in and Father Valen. Father Valen coming in from India. And myself coming in from America. Father Suzelle coming in from the Philippines and, and Korea and so on. Um, and so we're just uh, providing. And then till Remember, in the 70s, when the first priest came here from the SSPX, it was what, once a year or something? Because Father Cummins was around with a few other priests. And then in India, for instance, they had once a year, twice a year. Singapore was once a year, twice a year. And then now they got a priory in Singapore, right? In India, you know, it's been a priory since 1984. It was the first priory of the SSPX in Asia. It was India. And, uh, you know, and so we used to go around. I went around to say masses in India. Some places were once a year, twice a year. Uh, some places were every month. Some places were every week. You know, and it was just the two of us going around, the priests of the north, we went everywhere, you know, in Delhi and Bombay and Madras and Bangalore and Goa. And, you know, we went around and said the Mass. And, uh, you know, but uh, now many of those people that are with us are standing very strong in India. And they didn't think, they didn't know how the priest was going to come. Well, now we've got two priests. We've got Father Valen, Father Pankras. And, uh, and uh, there may be others. God's for, God will provide. I don't know how or when, but he will. Yeah. God will provide 
know how to build the ark, and in some ways, you know, you're probably going to do something else still. What that is correct, and that's what we're doing right now. We're building the ark in Kentucky. But what does the parish down here we can do? Like Brisbane's got a committee, they've got a they're, built, they're looking for a building, a church to build, they've got something on their mind. Well, I think um, here you've got to just keep some meeting every week in a place like this. No, but I'm talking about what can we actually do to establish ourselves, and we might well, attract a, pr a priest. You, well, you're already doing it now. You've got your little priest. altar built, you know, you've got the backdrop, you've got some of these practical things, you've got a group of people. The main thing is you meet every week and pray. I know not ever. I know that there's also people that are, haven't made that decision yet. I understand it's a very difficult decision to decide to not go to the SSPX mainstream masses anymore. Uh, it is a right decision to make because of the danger to the faith, because you're being slowly dragged away by the new thinking. However, it's not easy to make. It takes grace to make it, so we don't condemn those that haven't made that decision yet. Uh, but what we do is we just say that um, we've got to... Um, Keep doing exactly what you're doing, and and pray because God will provide the priest. I don't I don't think that uh, you know setting up because uh, one of the dangers of a uh, I would I don't like an overly organized lay organization because it'll, cre it'll create a parish committee. And parish committee equals an anti-Catholic organization. That's what will happen. And what will happen is that the priest will come in and he'll be under the dominion of the parish committee. It already happens a lot. It's already. In fact, that's what Bishop Carroll wanted the United States to be back in the very beginning. That's how the first priest came to Kentucky because he hated Bishop Carroll. He was the Belgian priest. He couldn't stand Bishop Carroll because he was a liberal, so he went to Kentucky and was disobedient. That's how we got started in Kentucky. So disobedience goes way back. <laughs> and uh, you know, and so he went straight into Kentucky because he was not going to take that baloney, and he started an order of nuns and the the, the sisters of Loretto, and those sisters, the ones in the miraculous chair stair of Saint Joseph, and uh, you know, down in in, in New Mexico, they're his sisters that he started, and uh, you know, and he he, he he had some good results of his apostle, but he didn't like liberalism. He just left, and so the the fact is that. The uh, Bishop Carroll wanted a committee. He wanted the priests to be elected. That's back in the 1700s. He wanted the priests to be elected. He wanted the people to vote for their priests and the priests to be controlled by the people like in Protestant services. He was condemned by Rome and he had to back down because Rome wasn't ready for that back in 1800. And uh, so, you know, uh, we, we can't have that. That's definitely not something which we want. And, and, and look at also, the many people are saying this error well, if we, we shouldn't have given the church or the society, we put our hard-earned money into Tainong, hard-earned money into Denver, hard-earned money into all these churches that we built all over the world, and we put our hard-earned money into it, and we shouldn't have given it to society, and if we didn't give it to them, we'd be able to control it now. No, you wouldn't. It would be an, an anti-Catholic situation. We build a church. The priest is supposed to be in charge of the church. And if the priest goes bad, and go build another church. No big deal. We've been doing that for 2,000 years. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, but we don't go against, because the problem with God is that he demands things to be a certain way. <coughs> He's not very flexible. And, uh, but there's a million ways to do evil. There's a million ways to make a mistake. There's a million ways to go wrong, but there's only one way to go right. So the priest should be in charge. It was right to give these properties to the Society of St. Pius X. It was right to, to, you know, put things under the dominion of the priests and the bishop, Bishop Filet. It's just unfortunate that Bishop Filet went liberal and modernist. Well, before he did that, the local bishop went liberal and modernist. The Pope went liberal and modernist. So we shouldn't be surprised at it, but it's unfortunate, but we shouldn't be surprised. So what we have to do is exactly what we're doing, not even need to do anymore, you know, the practical side, and just simply pray for the priest to come and then uh, take care of them when they do come. And then, uh, you know, because without the protection of heaven, you can't, we're not going to be able to do it, you know. On this trip, for instance, I ran out of money. But then, the, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, the, what do you call it, they got the call back, we're out of money, we're out of rupees. Said, well, you know, we're out of rupees, what else is, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, the, uh, and, but then, the, uh, some people gave a little donations, we're bringing it back above zero now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I, I, I should be able to fly back. I got my ticket to fly back. Uh, but, because, you know, but, you know, God provides. We just have to keep going. I don't know how we're going to make it next month. Mm. Now, nah, we're supposed to go over to England and all that, and the tickets are looking at it. I can't buy the tickets right now because I don't have the money. 
So I'll have to wait until I get the money, then I'll buy the tickets. And so, and uh, April 27th, I hope to be in London, but I don't have enough money to buy the tickets right now. So I'll have to wait, and probably on April 26th, we'll get enough money to buy the tickets and fly over. So we just have to, you know, God will provide. We just have to keep doing what's right, hand stand for the truth. And then we, we, and then the time will come. He will provide a priest. And we don't know who the priest is going to be. He'll pull someone out of the thin air. He'll pull someone out, uh, you know, and that uh, they'll come. Yeah, God bless you. He'll do that, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, but we can't do that. Remember, we've been, we've been, through, we already know the game. We've been doing this for forty years, so we know exactly what to do. Mass in the hall, mass in somebody's house, and then eventually we'll buy a place. You know, just like Father Angela did here, we buy the shed and we turn into a school. Father, I've got one in Streaky Bay. No, we can't say mass there. Forbidden. They're getting their own though. They're going to build it. They're going to get oh, they're going to try to, yeah. yeah. And they might be able to. Yeah, that'll be good. Yeah. They're able to do it. But, you know, we'll see what happens. You know, hopefully they'll be able to do it. But, um, you know, but they have the means to do it, fine. But that's, you know, which we've been down this path before. One of the very important things to realize from experience is it's important that the location be good. Yeah. The location shouldn't be too, too, too far out of the way. You know. But and then, and then so we can we can keep it. Now tomorrow mass is at six p.m. Is that right? Yes. Six. Oh, but it's not here. It's in another place, right? Yeah. In Montmorency. Montmorency. Yes. Yeah. Just a few minutes away. All right. So let's go. Maybe we can pack it in if anybody. <laughs> All right. Good idea. I got to see you then. Well, you got to finish the jelly donuts. <laughs> jam ball. That sounds dangerous. We call them jam ball donuts here. There we are. Making the right choice. Make the right choice. I don't know. I think it'll be good, but I tell you the truth. No, 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 no,